Welcome to the Warrior Soul Podcast. This is Chris Albert, and today we are going to be talking to somebody who I'm a very big fan of, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. Uh, Dr. D'Agostino is a neuroscientist, and he has been working with applications of the ketogenic diet. He's been studying epilepsy, and he has a TED Talk about how the ketogenic diet might end cancer. Today, we're going to be talking to him about applications for the warfighter. Um, part of Dr. Dag D'Agostino's expertise is in the area of resilience for warfighters and for astronauts and, and uh, I think even aquanauts. He, he spent some time underwater there. Um, and, and so we're going to be talking to him about this. And we're also going to be talking about applications, potential applications for veterans who are suffering from traumatic brain injury, suffering from post-traumatic stress and uh, uh, dealing with uh, different sorts of brain issues. First off, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Do you want me to call you Dr. D'Agostino or, or Dom? Dom is good. Dom, okay, yeah. cool. Um, first things first, uh, a lot of people have some preconceptions about the ketogenic diet, and, and they think it's like a starvation diet. They're, they're, they're going to lose all their muscle mass. But you've got a background as a power lifter, and, and I've heard in other places and other podcasts that, that you've actually, after days of fasting, have been able to deadlift heavy amounts of weight for, for multiple repetitions. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, during the days that I did most of my you know, power lifting, or I would say most serious about it, uh, were my early like teen years and early 20s. So I built up a, a base of strength. And muscle that I found uh, the ketogenic diet did a remarkable job at maintaining that and uh, and after following that for a few years was able to, I realized that uh, in periods of fasting or even low calories that I could retain my strength uh, and muscle uh, better than I could have otherwise and uh, yeah I did go a period of fasting I haven't really fasted extended periods of time recently but uh, but one of the tests that I did on myself, you know, in, in the lab, even measuring my blood work, was uh, the, the strength response to a predetermined period of fasting. And I did three days and then uh, waited a little bit and then went back, went back and did a seven-day fast. Uh, and was able to, you know, I felt pretty good at the end of, of seven days. Yeah, that, that, that's one thing that absolutely amazes me about the diet. I come from a bodybuilding background and a powerlifting background. I was one of these guys who was eating 10 times a day. And I actually got driven to the ketogenic diet uh, because I suffered from ulcerative colitis. And it was one of the few diets that, that I could actually tolerate. Um, I, was, I didn't have to eat, load up on oatmeal and, and all these other things I was eating at the time. And when I actually got into it, I, I thought I was going to lose all of my muscle mass. And then um, I went and uh, uh, after being on the diet for a while, I went to a music festival out in Las Vegas and didn't really eat much for, for three days except for like coconut oil um, and, and a couple other things. And then I came back and I PR'd on my front squat. And I couldn't believe it. Um, what, so, so just for the people at, out there, what is the ketogenic diet and, and how did you come to be interested in it in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the best way to explain it, I like to just start out in the context of fasting. Like we were talking about not eating. Right? So over a period of time, uh, typically about a day or two or three days, we've depleted our carbohydrate stores and our body mobilizes fat for energy. And our normal, most tissues can use fat very effectively as an energy source. Our skeletal muscle and our heart can use it very effectively. Whereas our brain has a limited capacity, uh, if any capacity, to use these fats as a source of energy. So our liver converts them to ketone bodies. And the ketone bodies can readily uh, cross the blood brain barrier and help to restore and maintain brain energy metabolism. So, and we knew that ketones were therapeutic uh, in, the, in the context of uh, <coughs> epilepsy or fasting and that they worked re remarkably well. We've known from millennia. And early studies were done about 100 years ago uh, evolving from Mayo Clinic showing that a diet with a macronutrient ratio, uh, de de defining the ketogenic diet, uh, of, of a high fat in upwards of about 80 to 90% fat, uh, a moderate amount of protein that would 
sustain us and just aid in rebuilding and a very limited, uh, or if any, amount of carbohydrates in the diet. And that diet, when it's consumed and sustained, would mimic the metabolic aspects of uh, semi-starvation or fasting, in that there would be an elevation of these ketone bodies, which really only uh, are present in the blood with sustained carbohydrate restriction, or uh, really sustained suppression of the hormone insulin. So by suppressing the hormone insulin, that gets our body to mobilize. Insulin's a storing hormone, so when it's suppressed uh, and its levels are low, glucagon tends to rise, and we mobilize uh, fat very effectively for energy. Some of this fat is converted over to the ketone bodies, and then that can like spark up and energize the brain. So from, from my perspective, that diet was used for drug resistant, or at the time they didn't really have drugs for, for severe epilepsy and seizures. And then as drugs came along, the diet was marginalized and then it had a resurgence back when Jim Abrams of the Charlie Foundation uh, you know, went public with it. Meryl Streep made a movie, First Do No Harm, about the ketogenic diet and that brought more pu publicity about it. It's one of the first things that I watched when I was researching this. And I was funded by the Department of Defense and the Office of Navy Research to develop a, a countermeasure or mitigation strategy for oxygen toxicity seizures. Also, it's known as CNS oxygen toxicity. It's a limitation of special operations dieting. The Navy SEALs, for example, use a Draeger rebreather. It's a relatively small, uh, compact breathing apparatus where it's closed circuit, so there's no bubbles coming up, mm -hmm. and there's a stealth component to that, uh, and it allows you to uh, be in an area and remain undetected, but if you were to dive down deep using this, it's generally used for low, uh, kind of shallow diving, but if you have to evade the enemy, if they can see you from overhead in shallow water, if you have to plant a mine on a bridge, on a ship, and dive down to 50, 60 feet, at 50 feet, if we look at the Navy dive tables, at 50 feet, you have the potential of having a seizure uh, within 10 minutes at 50 feet in a closed circuit oxygen rebreather, which is used. So, and this, they've had cases of this, and then they get kind of, there's precursors to it where they get twitching and kind of confusing and, and uh, kind of some uh, twitching of the eyes. And, and then there's pulmonary oxygen toxicity too, which is another thing. So the idea behind the ketogenic diet was to put the warfighter into a state that would promote resilience in that extreme environment. And, uh, and the ketogenic diet was not fully embraced at the time. Mm -hmm. So yep. we, we worked on developing supplementation that could uh, effectively kind of uh, allow us to circumvent the dietary restriction and the fasting to get into that state. So the, the supplementation would produce an elevation of ketones, which have an anti-convulsant neuroprotective effect, and establish that, that metabolic ketosis within 30 minutes instead of two or three days. So you can mm -hmm. consume something, achieve a state of ketosis just prior to uh, the dive. So that's kind of was the idea that we had going back about seven, eight years ago. And now I, we've come a long way since then. And now we study a variety of things and we're continuing to study this thing too and, and look at all a variety of different ketone molecules. Yeah, I, so just to, to for, for everybody at home. So when we're talking about the ketogenic diet here, we're not talking about some fad thing. When we talk about ketosis, it's not like a fad or, or buzzword or anything like that. This is kind of something that we as human beings have always been able to do. Um, but there's a process to getting into ketosis and you have to, you have to go through this kind of adaptation phase. And that if you look at some of the books by like Dr. Jeff Volick, and Stephen Finney, uh, the art and science of low carbohydrate performance, I think um, they talk about the adaptation phase, but what, what you've been able to do is you've actually been able to create different types of supplements. Like uh, I've got um Kigenics prime right here. These are ketone salts that can actually create create a state of ketosis for for uh somebody in in what is it about 30 minutes you said uh within 30 minutes you can consume consume a product like that and then measure urine uh blood and breath ketones and uh 
uh, mimic, and it basically mimics a response that would take you about two or three days to get into with a ketogenic diet. So it is pretty remarkable. Um, you know, the question is, there's a lot of things happening with the ketogenic diet and fasting mm-hmm. that may, ne- may not necessarily be happening with consumption of a ketone product, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, a number of studies over the last, I would say, 10, more, more like five years, have been showing that ketones have kind of drug-like properties or signaling properties that uh, occur you know, even in the absence of their metabolic effects. So the anti-inflammatory effects, they activate uh, various gene programs that confer protection against oxidative stress. Uh, they have a receptor. So, so these things have just, you know, recently been discovered. And when we first did our study with the seizures, we made sure that the animals were following a high carbohydrate diet. So it wasn't the effect of a ketogenic diet. They were following a high carbohydrate diet prior to administration of the ketogenic agent, prior to exposure to the oxidative stimulus that causes a seizure. And we saw uh, that in general, about a 600% delay in the, latent, the, in the latency to seizure. So it made them considerably more resilient even without the diet. Uh, my preference is like to follow a low carb diet mm-hmm. to begin and even the ketogenic diet, which I follow. And, and we do do quite a bit of ketogenic diet research and I kind of, and we do ketone supplementation. We do them individually and also together now. Um, but the, for various applications, it's been shown that the ketone, very different types of ketone supplements and formulas can have an anti-seizure effect that's equivalent to, or even greater than what you would expect with the ketogenic diet or even prolonged fasting. And that's giving it and then testing uh, 30 to 60 minutes later. And this is, you know, oxygen toxicity is very powerful, tonic clonic seizures. But we do that across the spectrum. We have an, uh, an animal model of absence seizures, which are seizures that occur without the tonic clonic. And it, it has a remarkable effect at uh, suppressing that too. So other things, you know, there's other emerging applications of the ketogenic diet, uh, which you can find on PubMed, of course, weight loss, type 2 diabetes, Angelman syndrome, something that we study, you know, probably about 20, 12 different things. So it make, might make sense that ketone supplementation may also, uh, or people who have all these disorders may also be responsive to ketone supplementation if they are responsive to the ketogenic diet. So that's interesting because the main problem with the ketogenic diet, uh, not so much for me, but for the general population, is compliance to the diet. Right. So being able to sustain it. So our vision is to, well, work with food companies that can make a ketogenic diet palatable, enjoyable, sustainable, uh, and to make it a little more liberal in the amount of protein you can consume and even, you know, allowing a little bit more carbohydrates in the form of vegetables, maybe some fruits, but to add a ketone supplement that tastes good (laughs) with that, that would achieve everything that a very strict medical ketogenic diet could achieve as far as neuroprotection, but to, you know, deliver a bit, deliver it in a form that's pleasurable to consume, (laughs) you know, and that people will follow through with. Yeah, it, when we're, and when we're talking about ketosis, that you know, we hear about different forms of the ketogenic diet. I, I remember uh, um, back in the old days, uh, Dan Duchesne's uh, underground body opus. Uh, he yeah. kind of was one of the first guys to actually talk about it, and he was a madman. Yeah. Um, and then you had uh, uh, Dr. Mauro Di Pasquale's uh, uh, yeah. anabolic diet, and then and then a, yeah. a bunch of the other applications. But you know, when we're talking about ketosis, there's there's different forms of the diet, and there's sort of this extreme ketogenic diet the, the the i guess i i think i've heard you call it like the archaic model before then there's like a modified atkins and then there's cyclic ketosis um it, it, could, could we consider ketosis to be kind of like on a spectrum yeah and you know the ketogenic diet or ketosis is defined really by an elevation of ketones you know from a from a medical scientific perspective uh the classical ketogenic diet as you mentioned is pretty draconian uh, and it's still it's still used for the pediatric population. Uh, it's kind of easy to administer because you can create you can have a, a medical food like keto cow, 
or uh, keto cuisine, which is a baking powder. You can make like breads and things out of this. And, uh, and it's easier for a parent to get their child to adhere to the diet because they're dependent on everything that the parent gives them. Whereas if you have a teenager or an adult, then it's actually harder <laughs> to control yeah. their, their diet. So for adult population that has seizure disorders, they'll put them on a modified Atkins diet. And that was spearheaded in large part uh, to the work at Johns Hopkins with Eric Kossoff and his, uh, his mentor, John Freeman, uh, who had passed away a few years ago, but he was really, uh, these guys were, they spearheaded this idea of uh, understanding if a more liberal version of the diet, which has you know, 20 to 30% protein instead of like eight to 10% could be used in various populations. And for the most part, yeah, the, the modified Atkins diet is a viable alternative and has a lot of the uh, anti-seizure effects, if not all the anti-seizure effects in some population of the classical ketogenic diet and is the better option in many ways, especially if that diet is supplemented with things like coconut oil or medium chain triglyceride. So you could take a less restrictive form of the diet with more protein, incorporate medium chain triglyceride oils into the diet. You got salad dressings, you got you know MCT oil powder, which I use, you cook with coconut oil, things like that. And then you can further elevate ketones to a level that kind of correlates to what you'd expect with a more uh, uh, severe version or a restrictive version of the diet. And then there's cyclic ketogenic diet, yeah, which has been used in the world of athletics and things like that. And that helps to reset uh, maybe your insulin sensitivity. Uh, you know, some people have concerns about uh, kind of down regulation of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the PDH complex, its activity goes lower. But that, that in large part, that's kind of dependent upon your carbohydrate tolerance is kind of dependent upon or glycolytic uh, performance, I would say, is dependent upon your training. So your training has a lot to do with that, and your body has a remarkable ability to adapt, but I think the jury's still out uh, on if you persistently restrict carbohydrates and train high-intensity glycolytic state, if that's going to uh, you know, crush your <laughs> anaerobic or glycolytic performance. And in some athletes it may, uh, in some athletes I think they adapt quite well. Uh, but I also think for me, I find that if I add a little bit of carbohydrates in, uh, and it could be you know, on the order of 20 or 30 grams into an intense training session, like a little bit goes a long way. Mm -hmm. you know, and I could still stay in ketosis, especially if I've been strict throughout the day. So if my whole carbohydrate you know, uh, consumption in the course of 24 hours is 50 grams of more like low glycemic, higher fiber carbohydrates. Uh, I can consume that in and around my workout. And that may aid in recovery. Uh, the little boost of insulin that you get uh, just prior to or during your training, insulin's a pretty, it's anabolic hormone, but it's also very anti-catabolic. So you might be able to achieve the same thing just by adding more protein. So that has been kind of my thing when people say, should I, you know, add a carb day in? Uh, my thing is, I think you can get by, especially older athletes, maybe not so much for a teenager or a young guy who should probably be eating carbohydrates anyway, if he's trying to gain weight or gain muscle maybe. But, uh, but just for someone, I mean, myself an as an example, on days that I do, uh, if I get to the gym and do heavy training, I'll just simply boost my calories by 500, 2,000 calories uh, extra that day on a leg day or a back day or something like that and spike the calories up about twice a week. I don't typically kick me out of ketosis because it's extra protein. But that extra protein, especially if I keep my body a little bit hungry, which I tend to do, uh, I kind of stay in a fasted state, you know, about uh, fairly deep into fasting now uh, until I eat tonight. Uh, but I think that extra boost in protein uh, will achieve the result that a lot of people are looking for, you know, uh, when they kind of do cyclic. And it will kick you out of ketosis. So in a way, it's cyclic. But it's just not uh, binging on carbohydrates to the point where, you know, it puts you in wild 
postprandial glucose excursions <laughs> that can uh, not only not get a ketosis, but it has uh, unwanted hormonal fluctuations and glucose fluctuations that, that result from that. And a real foggy effect at times. And, and that's something I wanted to mention. Um, you know, when we're talking about the warfighter and, and maybe somebody who's serving in a U.S. Army or U.S. Marine Corps line company and, and um, you know, their, their diet mostly consists when they're out in the field or if they're in a combat zone consists of MREs. And these MREs have things like pound cake in them, crackers, uh, loaded with carbohydrates, you know, juice powders, those types of things. Um, for, for that individual, and, and I've been there, um, you know, serving in, in the infantry, you know, after you eat something like that, you know, about an hour or two later, you start to, you, you're trying to keep your eyes open and you're trying to keep alert. Um, can we talk about the potential benefits of, of ketosis for somebody there who, who, who needs to stay alert, who needs to stay cognitively sharp and who needs to, to be on top of their game? And, and I know that there's been some studies that suggest that a lot of the friendly fire incidents that have happened have happened because of uh, low, low blood sugar. Um, or, or, or drops in blood sugar. Could you talk about that for a little bit? That's interesting, and it doesn't surprise me about the friendly fire. So, mm -hmm. yeah, your your judgment, your reaction time, and uh, your ability to engage the enemy accurately will be highly dependent upon you know the energetic state of your brain. And if you you're in a hypoglycemic episode, I mean, I have a type one diabetic student here. And I've seen what happens when it goes uh, it goes low. I mean, he has it managed very very well on the modified, you know, low carb diet now. But I've seen it; it's pretty scary. Like he doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't know his sense of judgment is pretty low. Uh, so I think it has tremendous implications for the warfighter uh, from numerous perspectives. So uh, maybe the first being, and then you know, I've I've talked with the folks at Natick. They they make the MREs. Mm -hmm. uh, they make things like the first strike ration, <laughs> which right. is basically, you know, uh, sugar and caffeine. And uh, yeah, I've tried all these things and, um, and they, they are very interested in, you know, I don't know where the state of it is now, but I know they're interested enough that, you know, I've given talks there that they are considering ketogenic nutrition uh, for a number of reasons. One is that the energy density of a ketogenic diet, as you know, is, is much greater. With, with fat, nine calories per gram, protein and carbs, or four calories per gram. So that's less weight you have to carry. Uh, it's more energy in a smaller package, less weight. So it's, it's logistically, it's kind of better from that perspective. So from a performance perspective, uh, if your body is adapted to nutritional ketosis, pretty much everyone that you talk to about this who has followed and sustained a ketogenic diet the number one thing that they say is that, you know, I don't get hungry or when there's a uh, limited food availability uh, or an absence of eating for a period of time. So not only do they not get hungry is that they don't have uh, this, the, you know, the cravings and the hypoglycemia is not affecting them to the degree that it would be, you know, if they were on a carbohydrate based diet. So that has major implications as far as keeping, you know, your wits about you and keeping your mental acuity, your physical performance. So your cognitive and physical performance will tank very fast uh, if your blood glucose goes low in the absence of ketones. But if you can elevate your ketones, and it doesn't have to be high, it could be 0.5, 1 millimolar or 2, you know, upwards of 3. Uh, I'm of the belief that I personally don't feel good if I get much above two. Once I get in the three or four zone, I just don't feel as good as I do at like one or two. Uh, that that that's like your safety net. So if your ketones are elevated, you and this has been shown experimentally that you are way more resilient against the crushing effects of hypoglycemia uh, mentally and, and cognitively. Uh, so so I think. You know, there's a lot of performance benefits and safety benefits that you can get from nutritional ketosis, and that could be achieved with a ketogenic MRE. That could be achieved with a ketone supplement that's taken just prior to engaging uh, the enemy, or the energy density of it would allow it to be consumed every couple hours, um, which could 
you know, aid in, in a wide variety of things, you know, that uh, the warfighter would be involved in. If not diving, then maybe uh, uh, if not, not the undersea environment, be enhanced uh, under periods of hypoxia or, or, or at altitude. So these are just some of the practical things mm -hmm. and they limit, you know, the because you're able to kind of maintain uh, brain energy, you're less likely to be dependent upon stimulants. Uh, uh, I've had a number of, you know, I, I work for the Veterans Affairs. I'm a, a reviewer. I'm on study section for mm -hmm. uh, for the Merit Awards, uh, and there's a lot of grants and a lot of concern about veterans on opioid drugs and pain yeah. And uh, a lot of the emails I get are like, I've been able to completely wean myself off of painkillers because I don't have the inflammation that I had, like simply changing my diet, you know, decrease the pain that I have from inflammation, the headaches that I have from things like traumatic brain injury, things like that. So a lot of the, the guys that were kind of hooked on drugs and it's a pretty big problem, especially in Florida here, uh, that the diet has been a lifesaver for them. Yeah. So that's another, you know, thing in your community. There, there, there's so many ap potential applications on this. I mean, you know, ranging from, like we said about the friendly fire incidents to, to uh, first responders, police officers, law enforcement, um, trying to avoid situations where, where, where there's a, a wrongful shooting. Um, and and uh, I've even heard that, that judges, when they make their decisions, you can actually, they actually correlate to whether or not the judges had lunch or not the the severity of the sentence is actually correlates to whether or not the judges had lunch or not. So there's there's so much opportunity for study here. Um, you mentioned the uh, the anti-inflammatory effects of the of the diet and the implications for for people with traumatic brain injury. And um, my good friend Andrew Marr, uh, who served as a special forces operator, and and Dr. Mark Gordon. Uh, from the Warrior Angels Foundation, they've been putting a lot of study into understanding how um, inflammation uh, creates traumatic brain injury and also how traumatic brain injury may also be what's actually causing the, the rise in veteran suicides because he's saying that the, um, the, the actual shaking in the brain that a lot of military service members undergo creates uh, brain inflammation. Uh, and he created kind of an anti-inflammatory protocol for this. But, um, you know, when, when we talk about neuroprotection uh, and, and for, for, for soldiers, Marines, sailors, and airmen out in the field, um, you, could the ketogenic diet actually attenuate the effects of, of uh, these types of issues down the line once they get back into the civilian world? Yeah, I, I think even from a maybe a prophylactic point of view, if they're in a state of ketosis when they get injury, too. But uh, but I think most importantly, you know, well that's important. But importantly, there are a lot of guys now that are suffering from traumatic brain injury, um, and if it's a penetrating traumatic brain injury, about eighty over eighty upwards of ninety percent of those people will have seizures resulting from a penetrating. Uh, traumatic brain injury has been shown at one point in time or uh, maybe sustained seizures. So, and we know the diet already is a proof for that, you know, it has remarkable anti-seizure effects. So it, it kind of makes sense to put them on the diet or supplements. Uh, so a couple things happen depending on the nature of the traumatic brain injury, where, where it's at. And um, it, there's a number of things that can happen. And most importantly is that usually brain energy uh, is disrupted in a way where you're disrupting glucose metabolism in the brain. And there's a couple key, I guess you would call like governors or stop points where that may be inhibiting uh, normal glucose metabolism. And one is the, the transporter for the receptor and another is pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So these are two things that the ketogenic diets actually remarkably effective at uh, treating because it's used for a disorder called PDH deficiency and also uh, glucose transporter deficiency. So it's, it's clinically accepted and implemented for those conditions. And it just turns out that with a brain injury, these are like the two regulatory pathways that are impaired 
that prevent uh, normal brain function from happening. And it, it's kind of like a stress response. Maybe the brain's way of decreasing, you know, glucose availability and oxidation uh, and decreasing overall metabolism as a survival response. But this an impairment of metabolism can result in a larger degree of necrotic necrosis in the brain, in the what we call the penumbra, like the expanding region of damage in the brain. And then that occurs more acutely. So if there is a brain injury, the best thing to do would be to, uh, in my opinion, would be to, it's like a mini stroke. It's like a bunch of mini strokes because you shake the brain and a lot of capillaries break and you have kind of this global, it's regional, but kind of global in the sense that there's multiple capillaries and it's impairing a region of, uh, uh, of normal brain metabolism. So the best thing to do is to kind of restore or maintain normal metabolic function uh, and reverse uh, the glucose and the brain energy metabolism deficit, and also probably to restore the level of oxygen in the brain. Because when you uh, damage the blood vessels, the two things that affect the brain uh, metabolism is substrate, right? That's glucose or ketones in this effect to get around it, and oxygenation. Mm -hmm. So blood levels of, uh, or tissue levels of oxygen can sharply drop. Now, one way to restore brain oxygenation would be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And, uh, and I think- We've got uh, Dr. Uh, Cher on to talk about that here. Yeah, Dr. Cher, yep. And I think this morning on Good Morning America, I believe that Dr. Paul Harch will be on there with Eden Carlson, who is a child that sustained uh, a pretty dramatic brain injury, hypoxia injury, uh, and was able to, Paul Harch, you know, in, in giving hyperbaric oxygen therapy, was able to reverse the atrophy of the brain and also restore neurological function. And to my knowledge, uh, that's, not, that's never been shown before uh, or documented in such a way where they have brain scans to show it. So the thing that, that's remarkable is that he implemented a therapeutic uh, a hyperbaric oxygen therapy protocol that pretty much undoubtedly, you know, reverses brain injury. So one thing to, to understand though, is that kids' brains are remarkably adaptable, remarkably plastic and regenerative compared to adults. Adults have that same capacity, but it's, it's limited and attenuated compared to the robust regenerative capacity of, of children, right? So reverse, you know, restore brain uh, energy uh, with different substrates, and that could be, I could go into talking about that, and restore oxygen levels. And that will help attenuate the neuroinflammation that, you know, is associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the CTE that is experienced with, you know, football players, for example, that have concussions. So, uh, so that's neuroinflammation that's persistent, I believe. And ketones have um, they block many inflammatory pathways in the body, including a particular protein complex that when it's prevented from being activated, uh, it prevents the elevation of specific cytokines that are known to be implicated in this neuroinflammation. So that would be, I know for the science people, NLRP3 inflammasome, and then there's a uh, there's IL-1 beta and uh, IL-6 and a number of, of you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines that cause that brain swelling, the inflammation, the headaches, the brain fog. And we think that that neuroinflammation is linked to seizures and the neuroinflammation is also linked to things like depression. Right, and right. Maybe suicide and things like that. So I came from a recent conference where they have imaging technologies that are PET imaging, but instead of uh, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, they use a molecule that can detect inflammation. And, and inflammation, it's thought could be a predictor of that person having, uh, or neuroinflammation is a predictor of that person having a seizure. So, and a seizure also stimulates neuroinflammation. So it can kind of be like a feed forward thing. Um, 
So Dr. That, Gordon talks about uh, uh, numerous implications of this as far as, uh, you know, ranging from depression up to, um, you know, dealing with, uh, if you look at, at, at a lot of people who've been convicted as serial killers, a lot of times you find that they've had a good bit of neuroinflammation. They also tested a lot of uh, service members who have committed suicide and, and they find neuroinflammation case, case after case. And, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because if you look at the efficacy of SSRIs uh, and SNRIs on, on the civilian versus the military population, the military population, it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, they, they, they just haven't had a lot of efficacy from, from those drugs as compared to the civilian population where, where they're seeing some efficacy and where they're seeing some, some, some results. And it's just interesting to me um, from a scientific perspective, like, why are these two populations different? Are they, are they biologically different? They, they can't be, right? So, so, so what's going on here? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Well, uh, I think there's, there's multiple things going on, you know, with uh, the veteran, with the warfighter. I think some of the, um, you know, depression may be linked to uh, events in the past and the neuroinflammation can exacerbate kind of a preoccupation with, uh, you know, those kind types of psychological events where if you restore what we call like brain homeostasis and neurotransmitter balance, uh, which is highly dependent upon the brain energetic state, that that the whole outlook can change pretty, mm -hmm. pretty remarkably. Uh, and, you know, even the, the main theme now when it comes to neurology, you know, looking at the ketogenic diet, uh, the, the epileptologist, the main kind of thing that they point to, because we don't have an exact mechanism of how the ketogenic diet works, but it's universally accepted that it restores brain homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So it, it gets the brain back into balance. So the etiology of seizures is largely unknown for most things, but we just know it's an imbalance of more glutamate, less GABA, and we know the diet activates glutamic acid decarboxylase, which brings down glutamate, which causes neuroexcitation and stress and, and other and seizures, and brings up GABA, which has a calming effect. Uh, it's actually something that I measured when uh, uh, I did various measurements on myself <laughs> in a state of ketosis when I was uh, actually on a NASA extreme environment mission operations where uh, I did a variety of things. One was measuring neurotransmitter levels and my, my GABA level was at the top end of normal and my glutamate was at the low end of normal. And it was about a ratio of about double or triple than what would be normally if I was on a normal diet. So that's some of the data that has emerged. And, uh, and we, this parallels the work that we've done in the lab and with our collaborators when they take, I looked at, uh, actually you can measure urine uh, uh, neurotransmitters, but we actually did experiments where we take out the hippocampus or take out areas of the brain. And then we analyze that tissue. And then, you know, the GABA, the glutamate levels go down and the GABA levels go up. And basically, that's a brain stabilizing um, that produces a neurological effect that stabilizes normal brain activity. And if there is, you know, an injury to the brain, if there is some kind of anatomical deficit, or even if you consume some kind of neurotoxin that's triggering it, uh, the ketogenic diet or a state of nutritional ketosis by elevating ketones will bring the brain back into that you know, more stabilized response. And that has a lot to do, you know, that's really kind of the thrust of our lab. And so we're trying yeah. to uh, not, not necessarily always trying to just make a superhuman and enhanced performance, but to preserve, preserve normal activity and preserve performance in an extreme environment. Right. You know, and that, that's kind of a different question. So if yeah. a normal person just takes you know, uh, a substance or a diet, does it make him a super person, a superhuman? In some cases, no. In some cases, it can help. But, uh, but most importantly, from our perspective, is the safety of the warfighter and the performance of that warfighter in, this, in a safe environment. 
So creating things that produce, I mean, we could say, you know, the, the CEO that's going into the office could be an extreme environment, right? right. Maybe, you know, doing all nighters and just has to meet a deadline and needs that cognitive resilience. Uh, or if he's training an athlete, an extreme athlete that's training and things like that. So, well, it comes down to, I think, not, you know, not just trying to make somebody a superhuman, but, but once they're done with their service and, and they're getting up into to their mid to late thirties, yeah. like I am, and, and I'm feeling it, you know what I mean? What, what, uh, you know, I think it comes down to how are we going to protect them later in life? Um, once, what, cause when you're 18 to 25, you don't feel a lot. And a lot of these guys are so full of piss and vinegar that, that they're not feeling it at the time. But once you hit 30, 32, 33, 34, you start to feel these things and, and you start to feel uh, um, the effects of, of inflammation. And, and I think that's huge. If, if we could do something to help these guys later in life, we'll save the government millions of dollars. We'll save, we'll save a lot of people a lot of pain too. Yeah, that's a really good point because uh, we're physically connected to the VA hospital, right? And uh, we, one of my students did a project on wound healing and basically instead of, you know, uh, and, and the veterans uh, at the VA hospital, this is a big problem, a chronic problem. And a lot of it has to do with lifestyle too. Mm -hmm. So what they're eating. They're oh yeah. Maybe one in four them. veterans has diabetes admitted to the VA. One in four. Yeah, so uh, my colleague, uh, MD, PhD, uh, Dr. Lisa Gold, she was, at one, she was president of the Wound Healing uh, Association, uh, and she's an expert in hyperbaric oxygen therapy for wound healing. And we kind of worked on a project together, and it demonstrated that uh, ketone supplementation can impact metabolic biomarkers that can enhance the wound healing process. So we have various models of ischemic wound injury where it can restore blood flow and it appears to, uh, and even in the non-ischemic, it can enhance uh, the wound healing process. So we did a study where we did uh, young animals and then adult animals that were like type two diabetes overweight and it enhanced the wound healing process in both groups in the ischemic and non-ischemic. Non so we got some really robust data out of that. Uh, an application that you know I never would have thought of, but it just makes sense for wound healing. Everybody's trying to put something on the wound, right? Like a Band-Aid or some kind mm -hmm. of ointment. But if you improve your metabolic physiology and knock down all the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are creating you know, sustained inflammation, that, that's what creates, you know, impaired wound healing. That's why people have to be put inside uh, a hyperbaric chamber. And that's why people get limbs amputated because of the high glucose level is impeding blood flow uh, to that tissue. And if you take a sample of that tissue, the ATP levels, the energy currency of the cell can be knocked down 90%. So one simple you know, way to restore blood flow and the wound healing process is to bring glucose levels down. Exogenous ketone supplementation does that. The ketogenic diet will do that. Uh, and that enhances, uh, quickly enhances. So you get an acute response. You quickly energize that wound tissue and then you also decrease inflammation. That inflammation is preventing that tissue from healing. So you knock down inflammation and you can enhance the wound healing process. So it's, it's a strategy that's far more effective than putting growth factors and things on the area, which may work. But if you don't treat the underlying metabolic physiology and chronic inflammatory state of the person, <laughs> then you're not going to do much to enhance that wound healing process. It's kind of like healing from the inside out. Uh, so the veterans, yeah, that, that's one thing that really struck me. I forget the numbers. It's like billions of dollars, just wound healing, like, uh, like wounds that don't heal, chronic wounds that don't heal the numbers, it's billions of dollars. So, uh, so that, that's another area of research that we were into right now. And I'm pretty passionate about because, uh, I do see that that's a big problem in the yeah. VA and I think we're we're working with something that has a big potential to help. Yeah. I'm going to have to connect you with Andrew and Dr. Gordon. Cause I just think if, if you and Dr. Gordon spoke, it'd, it'd just be an amazing conversation and, and uh, a lot of good could come from that. Um, we have a little bit of time left. I wanted to talk to you really quick about palatability of the ketogenic diet. 
And I know that there's that, you know, I've done, I've done the strict version of the ketogenic diet. I've done cyclic ketosis. I've done it to where I've had the ketogenic diet fall apart on me before. Um, I know that there's a lot of new products coming out as far as, uh, things that can help to increase the palatability, um, in, and, uh, kind of, um, I guess, increase the percentage of compliance of people who are actually following the diet. Um, have you seen anything that, that, that really makes this diet a lot easier? Yeah. Uh, I think ideally what you'd want is like pre-packaged ketogenic foods, you know, that would be easy. Someone could just go online and a la carte pick things that's sent to their house. Uh, but there are a lot of options out there that I guess you would say fulfill that criteria of comfort foods, mm -hmm. right? So uh, under that category, I have, you know, some of my office around, around here right now, but I could, uh, you know, the things that have helped me personally are uh, the the keto cookie is something that I <laughs> kind of use on a, on a routine basis. Uh, on when I'm intermittent fasting, sorry, uh, one of the products that I take is a spirulina product. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Energy Bits. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah so uh, I intermittent fast two days per week. And during the day, it's spirulina and chlor chlorella. And I will consume that. Uh, it has an anti-inflammatory effect tons of many B vitamins and lots of phytonutrients without taking a vitamin pill. So that's a product that I'm pretty religiously stick to. Um, and uh, there's keto brownie is another product that I use I on a routine basis. So I'm trying to look into my, my, uh, my refrigerator here. There's a, a new line of foods that I'm kind of experimenting with now and have been eating for the last about two weeks. It's called No, the No brand foods, no. or Now, rather. Yeah, Now. now uh, yeah. So uh, that's, that's a, they're foods that they are not ketogenic, but they're sufficiently low carb that I could eat uh, some of them a day. And some would be a chocolate, you know, a fudge chocolate chip cookie. Uh, they have cakes. They have uh, muffins and things like that. So these are foods that have helped me. I put foods that we have tested actually experimentally in the lab, not only a taste testing, but we've actually measured the glycemic response to different foods that sort of I approve and they're on uh, my keto nutrition.org website. And I'll be expanding that food list so people can get on there and kind of check out and see, you know, kind of what foods uh, they like best. And, there's a number of products like I use, like the Ketogenics Prime product, uh, uh, Prove It Keto OS, Orange Flavor, uh, and Keto Logic uh, are the three uh, ketone exogenous ketone products that we've tested in the lab. Yeah. You know, through myself, in in, in animals, and, and other things. So they are the ones, and there are probably about a dozen out there. But and I've tried pretty much all of them. But they're the three that I sort of recommend you know, people to take and quest, uh, nutrition makes, uh, coconut oil powder and MCT oil powder. And I always include that wherever I'm traveling. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I include that because oil is sometimes, you know, difficult to, to travel with because it's a liquid. Yeah. There's a cool, um, company, um, I'm good friends with, they're called, uh, F bomb. They make these, these little packets. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're, I have that. Yeah, yeah, I had that actually. Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> so I just want to, uh, <laughs> my favorite version right here. So this was actually. That uh, stuff is awesome. The macadamia nut oil or the macadamia nut butter. That's awesome. Yeah, macadamia nut butter. So, uh, so yeah, I, uh, I've actually just started trying this. So they, I got this, we were at, so my notebook here, you mm -hmm. might be able to see actually has a F bomb. Oh, nice. Yeah, right? So, uh, so yeah. And then I picked up the sticker, but I have these and I've been eating them, uh, midday when I don't have a meal, like midday. Uh, I usually eat breakfast and dinner. And I've been having this, they have a coconut oil, macadamia nut butter yeah. version too. So I've been traveling around with these. They're very easy for traveling. So it's a product that I love and enjoy uh, along with the energy bits. So 
yeah, so these are just some of the products I put, like I compiled the products that we've tested. About 20% of the things that I test <laughs> mm -hmm. actually pass the test. And, uh, and they're the things that I put on, you know, my website for that I think people will enjoy it. That's awesome. And we're going to, we're going to put your website up, um, on the show notes and, and all these products up there as well. Um, I was, I really want to thank you so much for coming on today. I, I really think that this, uh, this episode is going to do a lot of good for people. And, um, you know, I want to acknowledge you for your work. It's not easy to go into a field as an academic that, that goes against the grain. Um, I, uh, at one time in a former life, I was a PhD student at UC Santa Barbara and I understand the review process. I understand a lot of the stuff you guys have to go through as far as, as trying to get your research out there. And, um, you, you, you really have to put the work in. And so I really want to acknowledge you here because I think you're doing things that, that are truly going to help not only veterans, but, but it's going to help humanity. And, and so thank you so much, Dom, for everything that you do. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm very grateful that you had me on. And uh, I just like to, to let people know, I feel very grateful to be doing what I'm doing and to have, you know, funding uh, this weekend, I'll be working on a, on another every three years, I have to renew, you know, my, my DOD or Office of Navy Research grant. So, uh, and it's not something that I, you know, don't look forward to. I mean, it's, it's exciting for me to lay out three years of research that will further advance the science and application of dietary, uh, you know, therapies and supplement therapies, too. So uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to be in this academic position where I can not only share my research with you and with students, medical students and PhD students that I teach, uh, and also just is allowing, I'm just grateful that this platform exists, too, that you're reaching out to veterans uh, I serve on Veterans Affairs study section, but I don't feel that I'm connecting with veterans and I feel kind of um, very, I, I feel that this is gonna hit a lot of people that uh, can really benefit from some of the things that I talked about today. So awesome. uh, I thank you for that, for giving me this platform. Awesome, it's, it's our pleasure. And for everybody out there listening to this episode, uh, I hope you learned a lot. Now get out there and live your best life.